Yeah, I was born in Minneapolis. I lived here for the first few years of my life, and then my parents moved to a southwestern suburb, Edina, Minnesota, when I was um, in elementary school. Yeah, I've always kind of straddled um, like the suburbs with the city just because my parents, my mom's church was always in the city and I have family here. I went to school um, in like more of like a residential suburban area and um, yeah, but always the Twin Cities. It's all like, it's all within like a three mile radius. (laughs) I have really strong memories of hanging out with my siblings. I'm one of four kids and we're all very close in age just outdoors up in northern Minnesota in the woods and in the lakes and just like playing make-believe and the forts that we would build and the characters we would pretend to be. Yeah, most of my like very early memories, one of my siblings is in them, you know, because you're kind of really obviously in close proximity to each other all the time. So I think little like moments of consciousness that for whatever reason still linger like my brother's right there or my sister or whatever i i think like as someone who was born and raised in minnesota like snow and winter time is obviously just a huge part of life up here strong memories of like boots getting stuck in snow drifts while waiting for the bus and like just how exhausting it is to walk up the sledding hill with your snow pants on after you sled down it and i grew up playing hockey and um skating was a big part of my life as a child so like very distinct memories of like the smell of snow and the sound of like blades carving on ice all that yeah often on like new year's eve or near a a outdoor hockey rink there would be like bonfires or little pits that people could stand around and warm up and yeah so i love fires any time of year (laughs) it's a good way to bring people together my uh, family, we like grew up singing songs, you know, before every meal. That was kind of my mom is a Lutheran pastor, yeah. so we would sing a song often um, before eating. But also, just with my mom in the church growing up, like hymns and like singing in choirs, I think like those are some of my really early memories too. It's just being a little kid and not really knowing the words, but liking singing with everyone. (laughs) The public schools that I went to had amazing music programs and really passionate music educators and um, they were really good at um, supporting the kids who showed interest in it and yeah I had a lot of teachers be like hey you seem you seem like you really like this. <laughs> I mean, I played flute in the band, and um, it was a, it's a melody instrument, so it's not that different from singing, but c- totally different category, obviously, and really fun to do both. May it hold you as you are, and meet you in... Patience is a spell to cast. Mine never seems to last longer than a Midwest sunset wrapping around the city. Um, yeah, I, I think I was in many ways like just the latecomer to John Prine's work simply because my parents, um, I think they're fans of his, but they didn't really, it's not like I grew up listening to John Prine really. They were, they were more of like the Bruce Springsteen variety of music. Um, as I was getting more and more into songwriting and connecting with other songwriters in Minnesota and the Midwest and beyond, um, his name kept coming up or I would hear someone perform a song and they'd say it was a cover by John Prine or sometimes people would just play a song and I'd be like, did you write that? And they're like, no, it was John Prine. And it just kind of kept happening where I was like, man, I need to get to know this songwriter. And something that I learned a lot the more I like studied him was just how generous he was with songs. Like you hear people covering his, I mean like Bonnie Raitt, for example, who was one of my favorite artists. And I like thought that she wrote Angel from Montgomery because I was so green, you know, I had no idea. And then learning that was a John Prine tune, but writing songs in a way that like allows other artists to like make the song their own too. I mean, what, talk about a talent. That's not something people talk about very often, but 
writing so honestly from other perspectives so that you in some ways can't even tell who wrote it because it's just a true song and it's almost like it always existed or something that was that was something that I felt really moved by in his work and for some reason like no matter where you are no matter what you're doing if you play a John Prine tune in a room people will like it that I mean that's my experience maybe I'm wrong <laughs> maybe I could encounter a place where it doesn't go over well but you just see people kind of lean back and sink into the song and often people know the words so it becomes sort of a collective shared musical experience and yeah I just I just think he was a really generous storyteller and um and he could do so much with just one lyric you know he taught me how to like edit kind of it's like well you could tell the whole story in a paragraph or you could be really like clever and put it in one line and yeah well so the the house where i was living with addy who produced the record um was in south minneapolis so I, yeah it is it it is an older house and i would guess it was built around the 1900s uh, and it's a neighborhood of minneapolis that has really transformed through the years as well um it's it's like a, i think one def like defining thing about it is it's been like an immigrant neighborhood which you know for place, a long time. And I think it's just really cool to take all that into consideration and um, and allow it to like seep into the music. And me and Addie used to joke about like which room was which song, <laughs> and like so there's a song on the record called um, "My Pillow Is a River," and I. Who's to say? Who's to say? Across the river, pillow bank. I'll stay, I'll and I stay, that's the one song on the record I have no recollection of writing because I actually wrote it when I had COVID and I had a really high fever and I like I think I was just like in a fever dream when I wrote that and the, the lyrics are kind of like nonsensical and cyclical as well and that one's definitely like the fever dream in my bedroom the pink moon rising to the east Day. I was not as kind as I John Prine, Pink Moon for John Prine, the second verse is about like eating leftovers at the table. So that one's very much like the, you know, the dining room table with sitting with my partner and like eating leftovers and being like, it's still a pandemic. Like, what the heck are we going to do? Like, <laughs> There's another song on the record called Plum Sky, and if you listen closely, it's like, I don't know if this is obvious unless I say it, but a person is like taking a shower, and at this house we only had like a basement shower that was like really tiny and kind of scary, and it was like, oh, it's a pan, like, before the pandemic, it was like, it's kind of not ideal, but we'll never be here. We're always on tour. Who cares? And then, of course, we're like living there, having to like go down two flights of stairs to this like kind of intense basement area to like take a shower that was so small that you had to like walk around, and, like turn like very carefully. And a couple of our roommates couldn't even fit in the shower. Like, and so we always joked that Plum Sky was the basement shower song. On the day we are together again On the day we are together again the, the, On the day we are together again That's a song written in the style of like an Irish pub tune And that one feels like the kitchen to me Just like the hearth, the home, um, the warm place Where everyone always ends up congregating Even though there's like comfy couches like, you know, right over there But everyone's just standing in the middle of the kitchen so yeah those are some of the rooms and they're they're um adjacent songs i guess yeah. i will pass you the salt the candlelight will bend when we share the same I, th I think a lot about spaces <laughs> and how sort of like things resonate in a space 
for years and maybe forever and how we are surrounded by these items that we like whether that's a wall or um, a kitchen sink or a door whatever it is we consider these things like lifeless but they hold the memory and the history that has happened and I think about landscape like that too like homes and houses as an extension of landscape and I just think there's there's like an ineffable memory in the spaces that we inhabit and that we move through and time is just like this fascinating construct that confuses me but seems also like a you know a sacred spool of yarn or something and I think you can feel it when you're in places where things have occurred I will write you a letter for now